You're listening to Frank Talk with Frank Sheftel and co-host Kim Yarbrough right here on LA Talk Radio. And we have a very special in-studio guest today. Yeah. Uh, my goodness, she does a lot. Uh, Charlotte Laws, welcome to the show. Welcome to the show, Charlotte. Thanks for having me. Oh, gosh. You are very busy. You've been making the rounds on a lot of different shows. I'm, I'm, I'm honored that you came to us today. Yes. Um, uh, Charlotte recently uh, wrote an article uh, that was in Salon, uh, and it was online, and it took off. And, oh, my God, I can't admit. Did you know how many? times it's been written or how many times it's been read or seen I don't see the page views but I know it's been shared a lot on Twitter and Facebook yeah I mean I, I started seeing it you're my friend on Facebook so I saw it immediately when you put it, but then I started seeing it everywhere else I saw it, everybody else is posting it I'm like oh my gosh god this is incredible and then you were on Dr. Drew you were on CNN right um, as, uh, you've just been making the rounds on this and the article um, has to do with what is very very topical right now mm-hmm. Uh, Bill Cosby, right. um, uh, your 34-year-old secret, right. um, having to do with a, a friend of yours, a, uh, one of your girlfriends back then, uh, introduced you to Bill Cosby, and uh, tell us, uh, sum it up for us. Yeah, what, what prompted you to, to write the article? Well, I, I had met Bill in 1980. My um, friend, uh, who I call Sandy in the article, she started going out with him around 1979, a consensual relationship. And um, so she was dating him. And um, I remember being in the dressing room with him, just the three of us. And he liked long hair. So he said, I will give you $2,000 if you grow your hair down to your waist. And then he turned to me and he basically said, I'll give you $1,000 in clothing if you help her grow her hair down to her waist. Mm. And so I was very aware of everything that was going on with their relationship. And about a year later, she came to me and said that, he had drugged her and had sex with her and she didn't consider it rape because she was already in this consensual relationship even though you can't consent when you're unconscious and she was completely unconscious during that entire you know scenario and she woke up the next day in bed and he was in the other room on the phone and she started getting dressed and he came in and said I enjoyed it and that was the scenario and I don't think she ever saw him after that because she was really felt betrayed. She was taken aback. She couldn't understand it because she said, it's not like I would have said no to anything. Well, yeah, I read that in the article and I thought that was interesting too. It's not like he needed to do that. She was already happily involved with him and probably, you know, as most people would, you know, if you want to experiment, you want to do something, sure, let's do it. Not a problem. Yeah, but you know, with the the women that are coming out saying these things, it seems like that's the scenario each time. Well, that so, it was consensual and in, in private quarters or private apartment or whatever or hotel room, and it just turned into something else. Well, some women are saying that, and some women are saying that they would not have had sex with him, and then they were simply drugged. Mm-hmm. Some people are yeah. saying that he put it in their drink. Now, with Sandy, he actually gave her two pills and said, these will relax you, but they actually knocked her unconscious. So, you know, at the time, I thought maybe it was a one-off. It was just some kind of an accident. Maybe those pills reacted to her body in some sort of a a weird, some bizarre way that was unexpected. And so I gave him the benefit of the doubt. And I didn't think there was anything to come forward about back then. The only thing I knew that I thought with, that was media worthy of you know of knowing was the fact that he was cheating on his wife. I well, mean, yeah, I, I was knew gonna that. Say he was, <laughs> I was going to say you know he was married. He's been in a long term right. marriage, and apparently he he's done this a lot. He's had a lot of girlfriends. Have so, you ever you know. met Camille? I did meet Camille. I I had not known you know before I met her. I thought maybe there was some kind of open marriage. Right. But I went backstage one night before his show at the Hilton just to say hi because I was in the audience with some other people, and she was in the dressing room, and he very quickly said, this is my wife, Camille, you know, like he wanted me to be careful about what I said, so as not to blow it for him. And so I was just very polite and said, it's nice to meet you and, you know, just chit chat. And then I left. I didn't say anything to blow it for him. So um, that's why I knew it was not an open marriage at that point Mm -hmm. onward. And, um, And then I saw Bill various times over the years, probably as 10 or 12 times, just casually backstage. He never 
uh, offered me pills. He never tried to drug me. Of course, I don't drink alcohol. I've never had a glass in my life, so I don't know if that has anything to do with it. But he was always respectful. He was generous with his time. He would give me advice about school and, and whatever in my life. And, and then in um, 2005, I had arrangements to go backstage at his show in Oakland and to take my husband and my stepdaughter. And that was right at the same time as the first woman came forward with the allegations. So you guys have re- remained friends for this many years. Yeah, since I've known 1980. him. Yeah, I've known him since 1980. So that's why it was kind of hard in a way for me coming forward. And in 2005, then I had this quandary. I didn't know what to do because I the first woman came forward, and I thought, I'm a witness to this. I know. I knew about this the drugging since 1981, and so I can corroborate her story. And so I didn't really know how to handle it. I didn't know whether I should cancel the backstage arrangements, whether I should go and say something to him, confront him, ask him about it. I decided to keep the arrangements, and the first thing he says when I walk through the door with my husband and stepdaughter is, did I ever drug you, as a joke. Mm -hmm. And I think he did that to diffuse the tension because he was clearly uncomfortable with all the news stories, but he also might have been testing me to see how I was going to react to that with regards to Sandy. Right. So, so you're you're no longer in touch with Sandy. No, I haven't seen her since 1981. So I have, no, and I tried to find her. I tried to find her in 2005, just searching on the internet, and to no avail. And then recently, a few, couple weeks ago, I actually not only searched for her myself for a couple of days, but I hired a private detective to try to find her. And he came back with a list of possible names, and I checked them out, and none of them are her. With with all the social media going on today, do you think it would benefit her finding her to reveal her real name? No, I, I don't want to reveal her real name unless she would want to come forward. And, I mean, based on the kind of person she was back then, she's not the kind of person who would come forward. She was really pretty sexually adventurous. She was dating a couple other guys in town. She was, you know, she, I mean, if Bill had said, hey, let's have an orgy with five guys and four women, and she would have said, sure. I mean, that's how wild she was. I mean, mm-hmm. so that it's not something that, you know, the sex part of it was never the issue for her. It was the drugging that disturbed her so, so much. So but but what made what made you feel like you needed to come forward? Well, in 2005, when the first woman came out, you know, with what had happened, I realized I could corroborate it, so I thought she may need people to testify. You know, she may need people to talk to the police this or talk woman to the court. <clears throat> Andrea, I believe, was mm-hmm. the first one who had come forward. Mm-hmm. And so that's what I was pondering. Should I say something? Should I not? And then Other women started coming forward. Some of them were anonymous, but they had gone to her attorney and said, we'll testify for you in court. And so I thought, oh, okay, my testimony is not needed. And then I just didn't even think about it anymore. I figured it's handled. They don't need me. And years passed, and I haven't seen Bill since 2005. And so I didn't keep up with the news stories. I didn't know what he was doing. I had no idea. And then recently, two weeks ago, whenever all this blew up, all of a sudden, then I knew that the women had not been taken seriously. And that really disturbed me that it took a man to come forward and say something in order to get the public to be aware, to take notice, and to take the issue seriously. And so I thought I really should say something because it's very cowardly of me to you know, be silent all these years, and it's really never too late to come forward. I mean, you should come forward and say something if you know something. And that's when I decided I should probably write this article and go ahead and at least reveal my experiences. Even though I wasn't a victim myself, I felt that you know, I can at least say what I know, and so that's what I did. Wow. Yeah, it was very powerful when I read it. I just, Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, as we sit and watch, I mean, it's like a daily occurrence uh, of people coming out, of new women. And, you know, as the number went from, you know, 7 to 8 to 12 to 16, I mean, it became at some point a a joke. I mean, almost. It really did Mm -hmm. because it just, it took this on a life of its own uh, with people constantly. And then you had, you know, somebody like Janice Dickinson coming out who had a little bit more fame and notoriety. And, you know, people listened to that. I, I remember somebody talking about her recent uh, appearance and, and discussing it and saying, well, you know, she's always out for publicity and la la la. And somebody else said, no, this time she was a clear 
coherent, very on a point woman in this interview, and it was somebody that you could literally take seriously and not say, "Oh, she's just out for the publicity of it." Right. Um, and then you know, uh, our friend of the show, Gloria Allred, is obviously mm-hmm. representing three women. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, one who uh, is she representing? Yes, she is. She is now representing the woman who claims when she was 15 years old, she was at the Playboy Mansion. Yeah, and that's according to the last reports that, that I've I've read. And yeah. yeah, Hugh Hefner has just come out what hours ago saying this is ridiculous I wouldn't put up with it and you know other people are saying well of course have you have a stake in it because uh, what appears to have happened is that Mr. Cosby brought a 15 year old girl to a party at the Playboy Mansion and um, you know assaulted her at at that point and 12 other former bunnies have come out now oh, so wow. well he spent a lot of time at the mansion as well yeah I mean I, I really do believe that that um, Mr. Hefner didn't know anything about it. I mean, I, I, I don't know him well. I've met him a few times, yeah. but I really don't believe he would have tolerated that kind of behavior. And um, and the women that have come forward have said that he didn't know about it. Yeah, and, and I believe that he didn't know, because uh, I've been to the mansion several times, and he really, I mean, it's a huge facility, mm-hmm. um, and he's a lot of time not knowing what's happening. There are a lot of other people that are running that, that joint, and so mm-hmm. I don't think that, I think it could be very actual, truthfully, that he did not know and was not aware of what was going on. So, Charlotte, what if if some of these relationships with these women that, that Mr. Cosby had were consensual um, relationships, whether they were sexual or not, before the the incident? Why why do you if if what he's if if what people are saying is true? Why do you believe since you've known him what for the past? 20, uh, 30 years. 35 years. Yeah. Yep. You've known him for this long, and so you know more about him than we do or our listeners. What do you think prompted this modus operandi of drugging the people that he took advantage of, if these allegations are true? I have to assume that somehow it excites him to see a woman who's out or out of control. Um, it's either that or he's trying to hide some kind of unusual behavior that he would never want to get out. But I, I really think it's probably more of the former. It's um, some kind of a power thing. It's some kind of, you know, it's a turn on. It's, it's a fetish. It's like the long yeah. hair. It's the yeah. same type yeah. of thing. And, um, you know, and I think it's possible that he doesn't even view it as rape. And the reason I say that is because, you know, I was recently reading a study where they had talked to men who had raped women, and 84% of them said they didn't really define what they did as rape. Some of them said, well, I took her to dinner, so therefore I'm entitled, or I've been going out with her a couple of months, and so therefore, you know, she was supposed to give me sex. And I have a feeling that, you know, it's possible that Bill felt like, hey, I'm Bill Cosby, they're probably happy to be here with me, why did they come to my suite, why did they come to my house if they Mm -hmm. didn't want this? So, you know, he might not have defined it that way. And so, and, you know, as I said, Sandy didn't define it that way. I mean, she was already in a consensual relationship, so... You know, she. Well, I, yeah, I think you kind of have to know if you you go into a room with a man and there's nothing in there but a bed and a dresser. Um, you know, that my my mom uh, guarded me against that when when I was a teen all the time. If you know the parents aren't around, if his parents aren't around, if we're not around, and there's just a bed and a dresser and you're in there for several hours, you know what what do you think is going to happen? Well, I think that's blaming the victim. So I wouldn't say that because I think I wouldn't blame the victim at all. Yeah, but I think people would, you know, go to somebody's room under some other pretense and Mm -hmm. and then something could happen. And, you know, I believe this last Playboy um, um, bunny who came out, she had gone to the suite, but she said there were four other men in the suite and they were watching sports and they were playing poker or something and they were, you know, they were hanging out and she just, they Asked, Bill asked if she wanted a drink. She had a, one drink, not even a whole drink, I don't believe, just a few sips. And the next thing she remembered is she was in bed with no clothes on. It was four in the morning and Bill was next to her. So, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't so, blame her for that at all. I mean, no, absolutely but, not. And I'm definitely, definitely not saying that. I'm a woman, for right. God's sake. Right. How can I say, oh, she asked for it? No, I'm definitely not saying that. I'm just saying sometimes a little 
discernment and a little judgment can be used in those situations. But how how long did Sandy date Mr. Cosby before this happened? She had met him in either nineteen seven, about probably about nineteen seventy nine, in the casino at the Las Vegas Hilton. And he was gambling and asked her if she wanted to gamble with him, and that's how she met him. And she had a date um, that night. He took her back up to his suite. And he also gave her money after each date. Mm-hmm. Um, I, she was never a prostitute, in my opinion. She certainly didn't you know, announce herself as a prostitute and say, I'm only going to have sex with you for money. And, all, and the other guys I knew she was going out with never gave her money. But she liked the fact that Bill was giving her this money. I know on one occasion he gave her $600, but I don't know how much it was on other dates. Mm-hmm. And she liked it because she didn't have... A lot of money. I mean, she had. She lived in a really horrible little apartment in a bad part of Las Vegas, and she needed money to pay the rent. So she thought, well, I'm not going to tell him I'm not a prostitute. He obviously thinks I am, but I don't want to tell him because I like getting the money. And after she was no longer seeing him and after I had lost contact with her, I was in the dressing room alone with Bill one night, you know, after a show, and I said uh, she was never a hooker. You probably thought she was, and he said, oh, really? Like, And I wasn't sure if he knew that or if he was surprised. And I said, she just liked getting the money, and that's why she never told you. And he just nodded like he was fine with that. And I think he actually, based on my notes, because I went back and I found some notes that I had made on my experiences with Bill back in 1984, I had written that he seemed to really enjoy giving money to women, women, because I had also seen him with another couple of, quote, girlfriends, and one of them had asked him for $1,000, and he had said, sure, let me make arrangements for that, and I got the feeling that he got pleasure from that, so it was kind of interesting. I was kind of privy to a lot of things. I don't remember these other women. I don't remember other than thinking that they physically reminded me of Sandy, mm-hmm. so I thought, oh, this must be his type, but I'm not sure that's really true because after my article came out, a woman called me who had worked in the recording studio with Bill and worked on the Jell-O commercials, and she said that she she knew Frank Scotty, the NBC guy who has come out saying that he used mm-hmm. to guard the room for right. Bill and pay off the women, mm-hmm. and Frank had warned her that... Bill has his sights on you. Don't ever be alone with him, mm. and don't ever leave your cup unattended in the room. Throw it out. If you have tea and it's sitting in there and he's you know, in the room, just don't even drink it. And so she already knew about this, and this was back in 1969. I mean, this was a long time ago. Yeah, this, this has been going on, these allegations since... Well, yeah, and that's another, that's another interesting fact, because you know, it's not like somebody you know, uh, last year you know, was, was drugged, or somebody Mm-hmm. You know, six months or something. These are all women that are coming out. These are many, many years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, why now? Why? Why now? Why all of a sudden? Yeah. Why? Why? Why is it that they're all coming out of the woodwork? I mean, at first, you know, before I read your article, when all the women started coming out and everything, the first, you know, the first thing that I thought of when it became a lot of women, when, it, when the numbers were in the teens, um, McMartin came to mind. You know, with the McMartin preschool, and everybody came out of the woodwork, and suddenly everybody was molested, and then it turns out that no, no, really, nobody was molested, and it just yeah. was like this. <laughs> This whole, you know, hyper thing, and that's almost how I felt when I started seeing this. And then I saw your article. I said, "Oh, okay, no, there is there where there's smoke, there's fire." But these, and yeah, there these is. allegations date back to 1970. Yeah, and apparently he had settled claims before. Uh, you know, this isn't, you know, and and of course we all know like Michael Jackson had settled claims. You know, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't admit yeah, guilt or anything. Not at all. Sometimes it's just easier to do that because you know to fight it and spend the money on lawyers and everything else. Yeah. It's just easier to give somebody a payment, make them go away. And that's it. But it doesn't, again, mean that it, it happened. It's just it's the cost of doing business when you're somebody who's famous and has a lot of money. Um, but it, this does not seem that way. This seems a little bit different now. Um, the allegations are, are definitely numerous and damning. Um, and consistent. What I find curious is most of these women, if not all, are Caucasian. Is that is Almost that all of them are. They appear to be. Yeah, I think uh, there might be one or two that aren't. But I'm just looking at pictures on the internet. You know but yeah. now that now that I, I remember back, I, I seem to remember one woman that was African American and one, yes. biracial. Yes. So why do you think that is? Why why do you think that there aren't black women coming out 
saying this. Do well, you think he ever approached any black women? Or you know, he, he maybe he has a certain type. Maybe my feeling of everyone looking similar to Sandy, who were kind of medium height, very thin, uh, white girls with kind of long, straight brown hair. Maybe that's his type. Yeah. I mean, even though this other woman who uh, worked with him in New York City at the recording studio said that they she saw other women, lots of different types of women going into that dressing room who, you know, went through something with him. But that was not my experience. My experience, they all kind of looked somewhat similar. So, you know, I don't really know what, what the reason and, is. And what Sandy's description she for is, our listeners. She's like five she's five seven. She's got long her hair was just below her shoulders, straight brown, kind of hazel eyes, um, freckles on her cheeks, um, attractive, um, didn't wear a lot of makeup though. Um, and very kind of from a poor background, um, kind of very simple type of person, and um, was thinking about going to the U.S. military. And she had also told Bill that. So after both of us lost touch with him, with her, um, I had a conversation with him, and he said, "Yeah, that's what she told me she was going to do as well." So that may be what happened. So speaking <clears throat> very speculatively, do do you think she's even still alive or in another country, or what? What do you think? I mean, she she's not that old, so she has to be around my age, which is 54. So she was either a couple years younger or a couple years older. She could be anywhere. I mean, she's the kind of person, if she's the same as she used to be, she would have been married many times. She went out with a lot of guys. A lot of guys were attracted to her. I wouldn't be surprised if she had multiple husbands. Um, but she also was very reckless with her life. I mean, she was, you know, sexually adventurous. She was willing to kind of take pills if someone gave them to her. She was, you know, reckless back then, in my opinion. So I don't really know. And I don't know if the military would have changed her. I mean, that would give her discipline. I thought that is a really good idea for her because that's exactly the kind of thing she needed. Mm -hmm. I mean, she was the kind of person who would sleep till two in the afternoon. And she didn't have that discipline plan back then. And so I think that was probably a good thing if she went into the military. And how long had you known her before she introduced you to Mr. Cosby? She introduced me pretty quickly after after I met her. I met her in Wayne Newton's dressing room, actually. And yeah, I was going to ask you, what were the circumstances with the behind the meeting? Of- yeah, so I had, um, I met her there, and, you know, Wayne's dressing room was kind of this amazing place. I was 20 years old, and it was such an exciting place to be because everybody came to Wayne's dressing room. Mm-hmm. I mean, heads of state, kings and queens, heads of corporations, entertainers, <laughs> I mean, anybody that's you might want to meet would show up. And he had a suite. Also, he would get a suite in the hotel afterwards for a party after the show and so we would hang out there and Sandy was a regular and I was a regular so I would see her all the time. I and mean, you were living in Vegas at the time. I was living in Vegas for about two years and um, pretty much the whole time I lived there I was in Wayne's dressing room probably once a week and Sandy was as well and um, and so that's how I got to know her and and we saw each other outside of that scenario as well. She came to my apartments a few times and we did some other things on the strip together and uh, she was dating a guy that I knew in town who was a um, in the field of security and um, he was a very sweet guy she tended to like black guys it seemed like because I never saw her go out with a guy who wasn't black and um, and then there was another guy that she also started dating who I introduced her to um, who was also an entertainer so um, you know, that was my relationship with her I mean there weren't a lot of women mm-hmm. I knew there and she yeah. was one of my closest friends mm-hmm. well you know the the late 60s the 70s certainly were the sex drugs and rock and roll era mm-hmm. you know we all know that uh, you know it was a different time you know things began to change obviously as uh, uh, you know the, the the STDs and other things happened you know it changed the whole thing but during that you know era it, you know it would not have been unusual to go to a party and pop pills or you know, do a line or whatever because that not was unusual now. Well, it's a little I mean, more. It is a little, is a little more unusual. Decline. It's a different kind of thing, but it's a little more. It, it is a little different than it was then. It Back is. then, it is. It was just. I mean, I lived through it too. I mean, it was certainly uh, an era of 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 free spirit. Everybody did it. Everybody. Yeah, did. yeah. Now yeah. it's a little bit more contained to certain yep, groups. Yep. And I could see.
see, especially in the celebrity circle and somebody like a Bill Cosby, that it might be even intensified a little bit more where it would have been more surreal. I mean, I remember working for a law firm, an immigration law firm in the uh, uh, late 70s, uh, it was around the late 70s, early 80s, and I mean, you know, the, the one partner had a thing of cocaine on his desk, you know, I mean, it was just, and that was a given, I mean, and, and, and you know, so, but it's just, you look back on it now, and you think, well, God, it certainly was a, a, an opportunity for people to take advantage in a different, oppor- you know, in a different way, um, you know, take it one step further than it would just a, a, a recreational thing to a little bit more of a sinister kind of a thing. You know, I never saw drugs, funny enough, and I, I used to spend a lot of time with a lot of entertainers, and uh, you know, I think maybe the rock and roll guys maybe were more into that kind of a scene, but yeah. I never saw it. I, I lived it myself in that way. I was I, I was with Shaka Khan, who, you know, a uh, 10-time Grammy award-winning singer, very big in the in, in the 70s, 80s, um, and so I, I it was, I guess that was, that's where the rock and roll era is, of the sex, drugs, and rock and roll, but I, you know, I, I guess I would have assumed in Vegas it would have been the same way. Yeah, not at know. all. Wow. Not at all. But you mean, <clears throat> you know, there are, <clears throat> okay, I'm just going to give a, a little example here. There was a guy that I dated that was an absolute horror. He didn't he didn't hit me or rape me or anything like that. He was just he was just not nice. My friend Cynthia dated him some years later, maybe a couple of years later. Nicest guy in the world. She couldn't say anything bad about him. So what I'm trying to say is I guess sometimes and people aren't stupid they know what to do around certain people mm-hmm. and they know how far to go mm-hmm. and what buttons to push and where to pull back. Right. So maybe your presence in the room kind of, um, I don't know, maybe was a deterrent for some of that or simply maybe you just weren't around the people that did it. Because I don't know how you can be that long for that long of a period of time and know so many entertainers and I didn't see anybody do any drugs. Well, they probably just didn't do them. The only time you. I saw I saw John Denver had a party once, and I did see drugs at that party. I mean, literally. And John I, Denver, oh my God! John Denver, <laughs> really? America's sweetheart, really? <laughs> Rocky Mountain High. Oh uh, God, my bubble is so burst. Jeez. <laughs> but I mean, honestly, I just—it's true. And maybe yep. you might be right. It might be because I didn't drink alcohol. I didn't do drugs. Yeah. I've never tried pot. I've never tried a glass of alcohol. Maybe they were doing it in another yep. room, and they didn't want to tell me about it because they knew I wasn't going to participate. Yep. It's possible. I, I say that's entirely possible. Yeah. Interesting.